I want to touch really quick on book six. Um, it begins, it's a, it, uh, even in this, it's just an excerpt of the book, but it begins with this weird meeting that you're probably wondering, like, well, who the hell are these guys? Um, Diomedes and Glaucos, they're two rival soldiers who are meeting on the field to fight. That's what they do. There's been all sorts of fighting betw uh, between the first book and now this one. Nobody does violence like Homer, quite frankly. You know, Tarantino has a lot to learn from him. He's just a brilliant for, like, the sound of the bone scraping. I don't know what that is. Um, something? No? I don't know. Um, you know, when, when you want to really get a sense of what it's like to have a spear go through someone's jaw, you, you read Homer. It's great. But you get... Diomedes and Glaucos, these two great heroes of either side, two great soldiers, and they meet on the battlefield. And then somebody, you know, you get the sense, somebody's going to walk away and somebody's not. Because they're two great titanic warriors. But in the middle of it, they stop and say, wait a minute. Do I know you? Do you remember this? What happened? They start talking. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> they start talking. We're about to kill one another, but you know, yeah. hey, let's chat. So, where are you from? Go ahead. Yeah, Diomedes warned Glaucus against going to battle against the gods if he's immortal, but he tells him that they could fight if Glaucus is immortal. And then Glaucus, um, he questions why Diomedes is asking about his lineage. And then he um, tells the story of Bellerophon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell the story or? Nah. Okay. Long story. Um, it, it's basically about his like ancestors and what they did. So then they kind of find out that their ancestors knew each other, and then they decide to be friends. Yeah. It's a little bit, you know, uh, a coincidence, perhaps? I mean, especially when you figure these guys are probably, like, wearing full battle dress and they're smeared with mud and blood and all that stuff. But, you know, hey, don't I know you? Uh, it's a weird moment. But, again, those weird moments when you go, oh, come on, that could never happen. That's when you need to lean in and say, all right, yeah, it's ridiculous, but it happens for a reason. What could that be? What is that little incident telling you? The fact that they know each other? Yeah. They know one it they know one another, but what do they discover in a more general sense? Their ancestors knew one another, and this was important because well, let me ask you this. If you run into, let's say, an old friend of your parents, is it a happy thing? If an old friend of your dad's is the boss at a company that you were applying for a job at. Do you like your chances? Why? You have something in common. There's a bond. You can go in and say, hey, you know, my dad always speaks so well of you. And, you know, I, I, I know I met you a couple of times. I, I've, got, I've got a photo of me when I was seven, and I went over to your house, and it was great. And we played checkers. You find a connection, a common humanity. You find idols. These two guys who, just on the surface, were bitter enemies. Again, they don't necessarily have a huge connection to this cause. They're essentially just sort of in it for the money. But 
they were about to kill one another. And then they just took that moment. My dad and your dad were from such generation. And there's this great story. And yeah, hey, how are you? That moment of connection, that moment of personal investment, that toning down of the anger, of the wrath, to recognize that <coughs> we have commonality, we have a bond. Not just with, you know, somebody our dad went to summer camp with, but with each other on a human level, beyond all the other crap. This is important. So when you come across this thing, this little incident that has nothing to do with Achilles, nothing to do with Agamemnon, and you're wondering, why the hell am I reading this? Uh, I don't, you know. I don't know about you, but when I'm reading something that I'm unfamiliar with, I start scanning through, looking for the recognizable names or words or something like that. If I don't see it, go by to that page. This little moment tells you to pump the brakes. Why are they telling you this story? Somebody went through an awful lot of trouble to memorize this. This is a long story. And when you get into the story of Bellerophon, it's really long. You don't do that unless it's important. You don't do that unless it's there for a very important reason. This is it. Commonality, connection. And look at the same, in the same book. Again, books are arbitrary, book divisions, chapter divisions. We get the story of Hector returning to Troy. Hector comes back to Troy. Hector is the great warrior of Troy. Hector is the son of King Priam. Hector is the brother of Paris, the guy who started it all. It's always the little brothers who screw up and they got to get bailed out by the big brothers. I'm a little brother. Um, Hector is the serious one. Hector is the firstborn. Priam has like 50 sons, so, you know, there's a lot of competition. But Hector is universally recognized to be the best. Hector comes back from the field somewhat reluctantly. He's been out there killing, doing his duty. Um, he doesn't particularly want to. He's a little pissed at his brother that he has to go and do this. You know, I'm always cleaning up my brother's messes. But he comes back and he's exhausted. And he has this little interaction. He meets, well, he meets a succession of people. Um, he meets his mom, page 262. She offers him uh, something to drink and says, you know, just. Uh, Wait while I bring you wine, honey sweet, for you to make libation to Zeus the father and the immortals first, and then yourself have enjoyment. Should you drink it, wine greatly strengthens the spirit in a weary man, as you have been wearied protecting your people. You know, relax, have a drink. He says, no, I can't. I'm driving. Not driving, he's fighting. You, you don't want to get into a fight with a broadsword when you're, you know, three sheets that are wind. Um, do not offer me up wine, sweet to the spirit, my lady mother, mother lest you sap my limbs of, limbs of strength. It's very rare in the Greek world to find somebody turning down a drink. He does, because he's responsible. He has to go and fight. And he knows, no matter how much you know, beer muscles might give you, uh, if you want to be an effective warrior, you need to keep your head. Moderation. Um, he moves through. He meets Helen of Troy, the woman who 
started it all. The troublemaker. The wife of Menelaus, who was kidnapped, supposedly, or ran off, depending on your interpretation. It's very, very vague. And began this whole thing. She is the goal for the Greeks, at least for Menelaus, to get her back. And she is always a little, uh, sus she, her portrayal is always a little bit suspicious. And you can see it's a little bit uh, slippery the way she is portrayed. I'm looking at like line 350. She is talking to him. Well, like 345. But Helen addressed him softly, brother-in-law of me, an evil-thinking dog who strikes cold fear, would that on this day when, my, when first my mother gave me birth, some foul weather storm of wind carrying me had borne me up to a mountain or a swelling wave of the tumultuous sea, where the wave would have swept me away before these deeds had happened. Now, this is uh, a little self-pitying. You know, oh, if only I hadn't been born, none of this would have happened. In fairness, this translation, first ever by a woman, Caroline Alexander, when she says, oh, me, you know, an evil-thinking dog, uh, for some reason, all the men translating this for the centuries before Caroline Alexander had translated that line. Not all, but most. Uh, bitch. And there's that sort of subtle thing running throughout. Um, and she is oddly... A uh, leading first, she's you know saying, "Oh, it was all my fault. I feel so terrible for myself. I should just curl up and die," which is a way almost you could argue of inviting somebody to step in and be a little. Oh, don't worry, it's not your fault. You know? Oh, I'm so terrible. No, you're not really. He doesn't say that, but it's sort of that invitation. And she also says, "But since the gods have so decreed these evils, then would." Would I were the wife of a better man? Uh, I'm not sure here if she's talking about her wife Menel or her husband Menelaus, who is fighting to get her back, or technically she is now the wife-ish of Paris. But now when she's starting to talk of the better man, you can almost see him see her sizing up Hector. Hey. A little leading there. A little questionable. She she tells him, "Come on in, have a seat." Your place? You know, you're my sister-in-law. Uh, a little shady. But he keeps going. Says, "No, I can't rest. I need to go find my wife." He finds his wife. She is walking the battlements. She is up on the wall surrounding Troy. She is, in effect, as he is coming home, away from the battlefield, she is outside the home, overseeing the battle. They are a perfect match in some ways. And they have this beautiful little scene where they're just sitting there and they're talking. And it's a really lovely exchange. And you can see how she is smart. She is challenging him. He's tolerating some of that. But there is a very honest and very human give and take. And the heartbreaker moment that is so precious. Around line 465, Andromache is holding their infant son, Astyne. And the boy sees his father. smeared in probably dirt and blood, and wearing a very fierce-looking helmet, armor for battle. And the kid cries. He's scared of his father. And his father recognizes this. And he's like, oh, and it's this little moment where the humanity of the moment is coming through. He had been all dressed up pretending to be this fierce warrior, which he is, but underneath, he's still just a human being, and his son is scared of him. It's this beautiful little moment. 
So speaking, shining Hector reached out for his son that the child turned away, back to the breast of his fair-belted nurse, crying, frightened at the sight of his own father, struck with terror, seeing the bronze helmet and crest of horsehair, nodding dreadfully as, as, as he thought from the topmost of his helmet. They burst out laughing, his dear father and lady mother. At once, shining Hector lifted his helmet from his son and placed it gleaming on the earth. He rocked his beloved son in his arms and kissed him and prayed aloud to Zeus and the other gods. This beautiful little moment of coming together and recognizing a family bond once you get past the superficial warlike characters, the costumes that they have put on. The son needs to recognize the human being underneath the helmet. Just like we all need to recognize the human connection that we share underneath it all. And it's this neat little parallel where you have this beautiful family unit. You know, come on. Big handsome guy, beautiful wife, adorable child. It's a nice little family portrait. That's what Hector is fighting to preserve. That's what Hector is fighting to save. Achilles and pretty much all of the Greeks have none of that. They've been gone for 10 years. They're just warriors now. Yes, they pick up some rape victims here and there, but their wives are all at home. Their families are all at home. Where's the connection? Within that martial spirit, within that army, they only have the outward identity of being warriors, and so they are consumed by hostility. Hector is a human being. Hector has a family. Hector goes home to his family at the end of the day, like he's punching a clock. Hector is connected to this world. And it's touching. And in sharp, sharp contrast to the other side of the battle. The Greeks. Bear that in mind.